Thank you so much, Nava. <laughs> so it's always humbling to hear someone else, you know, give your bio, but thank you very much for that introduction. And as you heard, I do brain computer interfaces. And the dispelling uh, rumor is that I'm not a neuroscientist. I've learned enough to be dangerous. I'm going to share that knowledge with you today and hopefully help dispel some uh, misconceptions that we have about brain computer interfaces. And I'll help by starting with who are my true science fiction fans? Have you seen Minority Report? Let me see who's. Okay. So, for those that don't have their hands up, uh, this is like in class. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, would you mind sharing what Minority Report was about, or do you remember the, the general synopsis? So this is what we call a precog, uh, is what they called them in the movies, and they could see the crime happening. So they were essentially reading their thoughts with this wonderful electrode cap on these different individuals, and literally broadcasting it onto the screen. Now, although we cannot read your thoughts at this point, not to this point yet, in 2002 when this movie came out, we did have a very similar device being used, let's see, a younger Dr. Randall, <laughs> with an electrode cap. So we were able to read signals coming from the brain and see thought patterns. Now that's the underlying premise of brain-computer interfaces, to be able to use those signals to then either control computers or understand what you're thinking. And at the brain lab, we're, we're doing a number of things around human-computer interaction and control, but this is kind of our new horizon for how we're interacting with computers. And I know this is a like-minded group in terms of seeing uh, what's ahead and, and being on board with that. So today I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about what are brain computer interfaces, what are some of those inputs to control devices, and work that we're doing at the brain lab. Now, you can read this, but I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. Brain computer interfaces are allowing you to control computers with just your thoughts. With the electrical signals coming off of your brain or some other internal mechanism. So if we talk about biometrics and physiology, there are other things that we can control at will to link into a computer or device that don't require any muscular input. So hands-free control. And I bring this up because most of us in this room are using some traditional form of input. A mouse, typing on a keyboard, even if you're talking about eye tracking, all of which require some voluntary muscular control. Unfortunately, there are a group of individuals who do not have this voluntary control. And we say that they are locked into their bodies. Has anybody seen Diving Bell and the Butterfly by chance? And so the main character, uh, Bobby, in this movie, it's a, it's a true life, his biographic, autobiographical depiction of him having a severe stroke and becoming literally locked into his body where he could think, hear, smell, feel, everything going on around him still cognitively intact, but completely paralyzed and unable to speak. So this could be due to stroke. It could be due to some severe accident. It could be due to ALS, which is also Lou Gehrig's disease. And we can't predict it, uh, but it's quite an unfortunate state. But if you imagine, we're saying you're not vegetative, which is you know, an unfortunate term, cognitively aware, how else do you interact with your environment but through some internal control mechanism? So about half a million people are in this state. And then we add on expansion of applicability of brain computer interfaces to us here in the room. And to help situate this, I want to introduce you to a couple of folks that I've worked with in the past. And the background is if you have ALS, for example, um, unfortunately, once you're diagnosed, you only have about three to five years on average before you pass away. I'll also introduce some exceptions to that, but uh, the gentleman in the top corner, Tim, he unfortunately has since passed away since working with him um, now almost 10 years ago. And he had a, a muscle wasting disease that rendered him locked in. At the end, he was still actually able to move his eyes very slightly. So you could say, uh, ho hold focus here for yes or move them slightly to the left for no. Again, even that is very powerful as some feedback mechanism. He was one of the first implant patients of an electrode into the brain in Atlanta. 
interesting for him, he didn't keep it because he was able to pick up taxi cab frequencies. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> the most compatible first, you know, gym <laughs> technology. Uh, the gentleman in the corner is David, and he's actually still alive. He's been diagnosed with ALS about 20 years now. So this is one of those exceptions. And we don't really know. Maybe he doesn't have ALS. But you see him pictured with his children, uh, mainly to emphasize he still wanted to have impact and interact and say, I love you, to his kids. Uh, you can see he has a, a ventilation tube here. That's also another big milestone for someone uh, where they're having to make a decision, literally, whether they're going to live or die, if they go on the ventilator or not. Now, the last person I haven't personally worked with, but you may recognize, right, Stephen Hawking. And he's also been diagnosed with ALS, again, over 20 years with this diagnosis. Key for him is that he's still able to control a device with, I believe now it's a muscular switch in his cheek. That single switch, I'll show you in a little bit, is still very powerful and, and more reliable at this point than a brain-computer interface for control. But what if he were to lose that for control? We would lose a brilliant mind if we do not have a reliable interface for him to still share his thoughts. So on the timeline, if you were to lose ability, most of us in here are you know, using traditional devices, fine motor control. As you progress along incorporating more assistive technology, if you lose voluntary control of your limbs to the point where you would possibly be completely locked in and needing a neurally controlled device. What can we do with brain-computer interfaces? Well, communicate, control your environment. I mean, this could be uh, out of outright need, or it could be from an induced situation. If you take, say, a jet pilot who is pinned down, they are locked in still cognitively functioning, but needing to attend to the controls around them. Linking into some brain-computer interface to say, yes, I saw the warning come on. I need to turn off that switch. Even to the point of saying, okay, we can control limbs. Now we're seeing prosthetics that are giving our veterans control back. As they're coming back from the war, well, we're restoring movement functionality. And we're advancing, progressing in how sophisticated these prosthetics are. Right now, I think we're talking about uh, connecting neural endings, but at some point, very soon, it will be directly controlled from your brain. The last bit is, what are you thinking? So here's where we extend into other fields, uh, especially if we're talking about business or um, psychology. It's the same technology to record your brain waves for control as for assessment and understanding. So here's a little crash course on neuroscience. If this is the front of your brain, we'll start going around clockwise. Right around the left part here is your language center for most of us. Do I have any left-handed folks in the room? Ah, so you truly do think differently than everybody else. And you may have already known that. Your significant others may already know that. <laughs> and they've just been waiting for scientific proof of that. But and that left part is where, if you're thinking of language, blood will rush to that area to fuel that thought. So hold on to that paradigm because you can control that at will. If you think of words, you can create a rush of blood flow to that area. You can create activation in the brain in that moment versus some nonsensical sound that doesn't require this uh, fuel to process that thought. And for my left-handed folks, it may not be in that, that area. It may have migrated. <laughs> All right, keep going around clo uh, clockwise. The frontal part of your brain, this is our judgment, um, executive functioning. You can get emotional thoughts here. You can also get um, attention. You can get calculations, mental calculations. If you're working out a complicated math problem, it's happening here. This is also the area that, uh, you know, if you're, significant other asks you, does this make me look fat? You kind of go, mm. in my mind I'm saying yes, but I know I should say no. That is your frontal lobe, if it's intact, saying, say no. <laughs> All right, keep going around. Right in the middle here is your motor cortex. So this is, if you're thinking about movement, seeing movement, or actually moving, 
we have fluctuations in what is called the mu rhythm. Coming around to the back part of the brain, parietal. This is spatial rotation. And then finally in, in the back, you kind of feel that ridge uh, in the back of your head, occipital. So if you see something flashing at a certain rate, we will see it flashing at the same rate in the back of your head. So you can imagine, we can use all these different reflections of thought to control devices. So here's our anatomy of a system. On one end, put a lovely electrode cap on you if we're talking about a non-invasive procedure and recording your electrical thoughts. You know, so we're literally generating these constant waves and as Melvin had discussed, lots and lots of uh, information coming off of our brains constantly. And you take this information, translate it into a form that the computer can understand and output so that we can control a device or a computer. Two different flavors to record these signals. Invasively, where I'm going to drill open your head, and that, so I'll be taking volunteers afterwards if anyone's interested. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> or not invasive. So I'll just put a, a bathing cap on your head with an array of electrodes. Uh, connect your scalp with gel, so it's like we're drawing a circuit to your, uh, each of the electrodes with the conductive gel, and read your thoughts that way. Quite unfortunately, I am not medically qualified to drill open heads. And it's, this is a, a disappointment, and you know, if I were to come back again, uh, that's what I will do. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the different inputs that we can get. And these are the main ones that I've worked with. Um, if we're talking about directly reading from your brain, electroencephalograms, EEGs. And these are the electrical waves coming off of our brains. And the main signals that I've worked with, mu, that's that motor control area, P300, and SSVEP, or steady state visually evoked potential. I'm gonna explain what each of these does in just a moment. Uh, the other flavor that I like to break it out into is indirect reflections of your brain control. And so that would be using infrared light to see blood flow. We can use a powerful magnet with functional magnetic resonance imaging to do that. Or galvanic skin response, also known as electrodermal response or a basic polygraph. So let's start with mu. This is that motor area. And we have opposite mapping. So if you're using your right hand, the opposite side of your brain is what's gonna be lighting up and vice versa. So if you, again, think of moving, actually move or see somebody move, we have fluctuations in the signal. Which means if I ask Shelby to think of opening and closing his hands versus being at rest, we'll see a spike in his mu rhythm when he's thinking of opening and closing his hands versus being at rest. He can control that thought. So we can input that into a system, let's say a simple binary system, where opening and closing his hands to make the cursor move up, or being at rest to make the cursor move down. Have it moving across the screen at a regular rate, think open closing your hands, open closing, hit the target at the top. Now I'm gonna show you this as an example conducted by my current interim provost, Dr. Ken Harmon. And you'll see he's wearing one of those lovely caps. And you'll also see he's sitting very still because no movement, no actual physical movement is necessary. He is controlling the cursor completely with his thoughts. To hit the target at the top, he's thinking of opening and closing his hands. To hit the target at the bottom, he is being at rest. And this is the first time he's ever done this. So usually we will calibrate the system to each individual to say, well, which imagery is best for you? Is it your hands? Is it your feet? Which hand is it? This is just a general uh, paradigm that we fed into the computer for both hands and let you try it. If you notice, he was actually pretty good at it, right? And that was his first go. 